In the 1970s, my mother, who was a Noligrad Senegalese woman, a victim of the societal issues of class in Senegal, gave me and my twin brother away when we were five years old. The picture you see on the screen is the only picture I have with my brother. I'm gonna start auctioning it and make money out of it. <laughs> this is the only picture for me and him before we were separated. My mother had to give us away because of the system of my country in Senegal. I grew up in 28 foster houses until the age of 14. I had a very difficult childhood and I was sexually trafficked to Paris when I was 15. I was a young prostitute in Paris. I slept in a tube station for a year and a half. At the age of 16, I was picked up by the police. My life started then. I want to share this with you so you know why I think I am the code. Today, there are 65 million children worldwide who don't have access to education. I didn't have any education. I started reading and writing when I was in refuge in Paris. I was mentored by the Moroccan lady who supported me and helped me. I didn't speak for many, many years. I was a very traumatized child. Today, there are 29 million illiterate girls live in Africa. 17 million are missing school. Many will end up married very early, trafficked like I was, sold, kidnapped, as my friend Ken Bank showed earlier, and nobody's paying attention. Nobody paid attention to me when I was growing up. I'm 43 years old today. When I start working as a, as a young woman in Paris, I start cleaning, I start working, I, I start going with the Moroccan lady to places just so I can relax myself. And one day she said to me, what do you want to do, Mariam, now you are growing up? I said, I want to learn English like all the people. The refuge we were in, we had 20 other children like that, from Rwanda, from Sudan. And the place was funded by the Albert of Monaco. And I said, I want to learn English. She said, well, there's a place in the UK where you can go and learn English, and we can do an exchange program. It's a YMCA in Woking, the southeast of England, very far away. I think she wanted me to go there so I can be less traumatized by France. When I went to the UK, I started cleaning jobs, working in bars, working very, very hard. And as I become very disciplined in my work, the agency said to me, you know, now you can start going and being a clerk, working in banks, working in supermarkets, just improving yourself. Then I started working for a bank as a data clerk, just doing input data. That led me to work for a big bank. And one day I was called by this gentleman. I was very scared. When you are growing up with a mind where you were rejected all your life, you start realizing, why, does he, why, does he, why, why am I doing this? Why is he calling me? He called me because I bought $75 million to the bank through lead generation. And he called me down and said, said, come and see everyone. I came downstairs, I saw so many white people, I've never seen something like that before. <laughs> I came because I was the customer service of the month, and everybody was congratulating me to say thank you for bringing this money to the bank. But you know, Africa was always in my mind. I was always thinking, Africa was in my mind all the time. Then I started questioning, why these people like me so much? What's happening? Then I started seeing images on TV, started seeing BBC, started seeing really the poor children. It reminded me of my childhood. Then I started questioning things. I had identity crisis. I started really questioning who I was, why I was in this place, why my mother is so wealthy in Senegal, why am I living in this place? I started being really angry inside. Then I started questioning. Then I started taking my energy in writing. I started blogging, writing, checking on poverty, checking on blogs, really looking at, at things. 
as I start looking, I start questioning a lot. I was disruptive, very disruptive. I start challenging the development community because I was a recipient of it. I start thinking about my childhood. I start thinking about all the clothes I used to wear from Oxfam. I used to start. I start to think about why I was on those streets in Dakar, in Kaulak. What's happening? Why am I here? What can I do as an African? After all, I'm free. I'm here in the UK. I speak English. Everywhere I go, people speak to me. But inside of me, there was something very, very wrong. And the year 2000 came. I start seeing experts in development, people talking about Africa, reducing poverty, gender equality, people just talking about long and complicated narratives. I said, but I'm now old, but nothing has changed. What's happening? Then I start writing open letters to my friend Bono and Bob Geldof. <laughs> I started writing them letters. I said, you know, back off a little bit from Africa. And we were few Africans, they were talking. We were really voicing our voice. Because we wanted to see change. And after that, many Africans started joining me, questioning what global development was. What was the purpose? Don't get me wrong, these people had really well-meaning wishes. They wanted to do well for Africa. But I just felt there was a monopoly of conversation. Only a few people were talking about Africa. They, they felt entitled to talk about Africa. It was a one-sided conversation about Africa. They knew everything about Africa. We, the African intellect, the African elites, we couldn't say anything. Then I start mobilizing my people to talk, just to question things. Then Dambi Zamoyo and I did a documentary, Give Me the Money. Those conversations started to create a discomfort in a global development community. We've been criticized, people, you know, okay, are you talking now? Yes, we are talking. <laughs> so we start talking, and then I think in the end they realize that, you know, we need to let them talk. And we start having conversation, taking actions in our continent. But I think I start really thinking, what can I do as an African woman in London today to make sure I can make a difference? I knew in the year 2015, they will all gather in New York to praise themselves about child mortality, about gender equality, how the environment is doing well. I knew they will do that. Then I was lucky enough last year to sit in a high-level panel where they said to Mariam, come, we really want people to come and tell us what we're doing wrong. Because after all, I was a recipient of global development. I was a young girl in Senegal growing up, having all these people telling me that my life would be better. But my life was no better. But I go back home, I see the life of people are no better. Then I said, I have an opportunity with the Sustainable Development Goals to make a difference. But I need to educate my people. I start working with the government. I start mobilizing investors, the private sector. They start talking about Sustainable Development Goals. We have a chance to do that. But think about it. My brother and I, we were not counted for. We were the missing millions in the 1970s. Nobody cared about data. We were the missing millions people didn't care about. Nobody could find me until now, my data is nowhere. So I started becoming a data activist. I knew data was a commodity. I knew that. My brother and I were not counted for. My brother lives today in Germany, in Dortmund. He did the entire Libya, he's an asylum here in Germany. We had a very difficult childhood. But my action is to say what? To use data as a commodity. Make sure that every single African is counted for. The young women who are trafficked today, like me, are counted for. So then I open an organization. It's the only organization today in Africa that's seeking accurate data. My time has passed, but I know that millions of other Africans passing by, the refugees, the traffic children, the, the people we don't care about, we don't count for in censuses, they need to be counted for. We can't go to the Sustainable Development Goals without counting people. Then I start going to places to empowering young girls. I use technology, I'm a technologist, I love technology. I start using technology to speak to people, 
all the way. I just came back from Afghanistan, where I'm going and um, work with marginalized communities, where we can talk to people, we can count these people. It's absolutely crucial. Then I created I Am The Code, a movement. Very quickly, I'll tell you how I created I Am The Code. I created I Am The Code because I was at home with my son who was 15. I said, I am going to New York. I need to speak to these people. I need to make sure they count the missing millions. What do you think I should say? My son, who was very kind, he said, Mommy, tell them you are the code. <laughs> Says, yes. I said, I am the code? Yeah, you're right. So I started checking IamTheCode.org and I found it, so I created the organization. And why I wanted to do that is because I wanted to make sure people understand how far someone can come to be where I am today and how, come, how much we can make sure the global development community is accountable for their actions. And we have the Sustainable Development Goals to do this. So I go across the world to, to mentor young women who have the opportunity to do well. They don't have the chance I have today as a CEO in London. They don't have this chance. So I go and speak to so many young women. We created the first women tech network in Senegal called Gigantech. We have thousands of women we, we mentor. We teach them how to code. They use amazing technology to be part of the conversation. What I want to say to you here is, someone needs to do something, as my friend Ken Banks said earlier. We need to pay attention. 43 years ago, I was that young girl growing up in Senegal, in Kaolak. 28 foster houses, raped, abused, no food, nothing. Nobody cared. I used to see NGOs walking around Africa. Now they have a chance. They have a chance to use the sustainable development goals to make a difference. They do. We have everything we need. We have indicators. We have the tools. We have money. We have commitment. Next week, we're going to be in New York to do this. But I will not stop talking until we do this. Because I want to be part of the people who is counted for right now. Because in, in the 1970s, I was not counted for. That's why I'm calling you to join my movement, I Am The Code. Join I Am The Code to help me enable one million girls to learn how to code. Africa has got a big manufacturing problem today. We need to make sure young women are part of this, the economic development of Africa. Not just as object of development, but as women and girls who can be part of this, the, the, the development of the continent. And we can do this with the Sustainable Development Goals. If we pay attention, if we pay attention, put empathy and compassion on the Sustainable Development Goals, we can do this together. Because you know what? You are the code. You are the code. Each of you here are the code. Think about it when you go home. Think about what I said when you go home. You are the code because you have influence. You have connection. You have power. You have money. And you can send an email in two minutes to make a difference. People don't like money because they are poor. They want you to give them opportunities. When I was growing up as a young girl in Kaulak, all I wanted is someone to come and hold my hand and said, Mariam, I want to play with the computer you just made. I want to play with a computer. I want to make sure you are safe in a house. I want to make sure that you are empowered. I feel for you. That's all I wanted when I was growing up. I'm 43 years old now. I'm so lucky to be here to speak at TEDx Munich. But I want to leave you one thing. Please understand this. You are the code. Thank you very much. <laughs>